Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you here tonight. Um, my name is Rebecca Kearns, and I graduated from the St. John's College of Arts and Sciences in 2015 with a bachelor's in biology. Um, I'm a 26-year-old woman with brown hair, green eyes, white skin, and I'm wearing a uh, brown sweater, um, and I use she, her pronouns. Very happy to be with all of you today and have the opportunity to listen and learn from our incredible panel um, about this truly important topic. Uh, I believe that we as humans and within the St. John's community have such an obligation to really educate ourselves and to act deliberately and concretely uh, to dismantle systemic racism and oppression. This session is going to help give us those concrete ideas and actions that we can take away with us and now act towards creating a more equitable world for everyone. So welcome to the fifth session uh, of the Racial Justice Conversations, Becoming Agents of Change. Today's topic is A Way Forward, Dismantling Systemic Oppression. Um, it was the purposeful intention of this committee to identify panelists, moderators, and openers who are diverse in identity and experience. Um, whose lived experiences and scholarship deem them experts, and whose individual narratives can serve as windows and mirrors of our own. Today's panelists are brave, committed, and open to both having and leading these racial justice conversations. So we thank them, and we thank all of you for joining tonight. We hope that you're able to review the recommended resources so we can have an informed and fruitful conversation. Our moderator for today's session is Nancy Kaplan, the Associate Provost and Adjunct Associate Professor in the Leslie H. and William L. Collins College of Professional Studies. Um, for her full bio and all of the presenters' full bios, uh, please visit www.stjohns.edu slash racial justice. Um, and with that, uh, Nancy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and welcome everyone to our Racial Justice Conversations Becoming Agents of Change series. As mentioned, my name is Nancy Kaplan. My affirming pronouns are she, her, and hers. I identify as a white Jewish woman. I have short hair, I wear glasses, and today I'm wearing a red shirt. I'm honored to be joined by a wonderful panel of discussants whom I'd like to introduce. Dr. Vibhuti Arya is a professor in the College of Pharmacy and Allied Health Sciences. She is also a global lead for gender equity and diversity workforce development for the International Pharmaceutical Federation, and she is a clinical advisor to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Glad to be here today. I, my name is Vibhuti. I am a brown woman with black hair, brown eyes, and a very short crew cut situation happening. And I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Thank you. Dr. David Bell serves as an associate professor and dean of our School of Education here at St. John's University. Hello, everyone. My affirming pronouns is he, him, his. I'm an African-American male who lost some hair some years ago. I have a pink shirt on, navy blue tie with polka, dot, polka dots. Thank you. And Mr. Rasan Cofield, Esquire, is a graduate of our Collins College of Professional Studies and is the current director, Equal Employment Opportunity Investigations for Lockheed Martin Corporation. Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Rasan. I identify as African American, black male. I have uh, short black hair, brown skin. Um, I'm wearing a navy jacket, a white shirt, my St. John's alumni pin, and Nike shorts. Awesome. Thank you. And Mr. Pablo Sanchez is an adjunct professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at St. John's. He also works as a data scientist for the Hunger Project as part of their global programs and measurement evaluation and learning teams. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pablo Sanchez. Uh, my affirming pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm a male. I have an almond skin tone, dark curly hair, 
uh, a dark beard and I'm wearing a reddish brown uh, button up shirt. Awesome, thank you. So I'd like to begin by thanking the university and those specifically involved in organizing these discussions. First, I believe by having these conversations, we are showing a true commitment to affecting change. I believe we are signaling a willingness and real desire to hold ourselves accountable to being an anti-racist institution. And I also believe, as I always have, that the university can be a catalyst of change for our society as a whole. There's a power to St. John's. Its impact on the world has often been felt in various ways. This is an opportunity and now is the time for our university to lead by example once again. It is my honor and privilege to be moderating this important and much needed discussion. Quite frankly, I believe it is also my responsibility as a white member of the St. John's community. Today's conversation, session number five, will focus on a way forward, dismantling systemic oppression. Our session will look to the future while providing concrete ideas, tools, and solutions of how individuals and communities can work to dismantle systemic oppression. For many people, it is not easy to fully understand what systemic oppression really means and how it lives in our society, often in unrecognizable and quiet ways. For others, there is a lack of caring that leads to not wanting to see, understand, or address. For those who are interested, though, it is often much easier to comprehend the ways in which individuals act towards others in prejudiced, biased, discriminatory, and racist ways. I think we'd all agree, though, the dialogue being had in our country now has moved past the need to simply be respectful, good, and fair to one another on an individual level. What we are now focusing on is a deeper examination of how institutions, including our own, play a role in intentionally or unknowingly contribute to systems of oppression. The ultimate goal is to dismantle these systems wherever they exist. For the purpose of today's session, the following definition of systemic oppression will be helpful. To give credit where credit is due, it is a combination of insight offered from Andra Gillespie, an associate professor of political science at Emory University, and the Aspen Institute Roundtable on Community Change. Systemic racism refers to the rules, practices, and customs once rooted in law with residual effects that reverberate throughout society. It is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. It identifies dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. I have been asked why this topic is so important to me, and the answer is a simple one that I'd like to share. As a young girl, a good portion of my education focused on the study of Judaism as a religion and culture. Learning about the Holocaust was a foundational component of my studies, and Elie Wiesel became a personal hero of mine. Some of you may even remember him speaking at the university in 1998, and one of the greatest memories of my lifetime is having had a few moments to speak with him. While he is known for having said many powerful things that could only be known by someone who endured the worst of humanity, there are three, three quotes I'd like to share that are especially relevant to this conversation we're having tonight. The first, no human race is superior. No religious faith is inferior. 
All collective judgments are wrong. Only racists make them. The second, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there may never be a time when we fail to protest. And the third, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. As such, I refuse to sit still and be silent on these issues. I have been immersed in discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion for many years, and I'm proud to say that my own St. John's and Vincentian education has informed my work with a number of anti-bias organizations and diversity and inclusion efforts. From the beginning of this session, I'd like to ask a few rhetorical questions and maybe even offer a challenge to everyone, but maybe even more so to my fellow white colleagues, alumni, and friends. Where can you use your influence to move the conversation forward? How can you, in your role, help our university move forward? And lastly, will you be willing to do the work necessary to recognize and disrupt racism wherever it exists in order to make our university and society a more equitable one for all? So with that, I'm especially happy to be part of this panel discussion tonight. And I'm grateful for our discussions and the knowledge, insights, and experiences they will bring in helping us learn what we can do, all of us, to move forward in achieving racial equality. So I want to start with our first question. And for this question, I'm going to ask David to respond first, and then we'll move to Rasan, Vibuti, and followed up by Pablo. And the question is this. Can you share a personal experience that makes this work especially important for you? David, we'll start with you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, that question is very complex because if I think about and reflect on my experiences, it's a it's simple event that happened that speaks to my passion. I can give you one example where I was sitting in a classroom of about 300 students on the campus of University of Illinois in a math class. Professor gets on stage and tells everyone that he was going to skip chapter one because we all had that in high school. And chapter one was matrices, and I've never seen that before in my lifetime. I can also provide an example where um, in speaking to my teacher assistant at this university, where the individual had a significant amount of content knowledge, but lacked the ability to transfer that knowledge to someone like myself. I can also speak to my first year in higher education in 2001, when I was puzzled to see the enormous number of students of color who are taking remedial courses and not giving access to college level courses. And those who had access were not provided support within those courses, but were told to go to tutoring centers. And constantly seeing these students drop out. But probably the one area which troubles me the most is something that happened to me two, two and a half years ago with my daughter. Up until this point, my daughter attended a private school. And in sixth grade, she was entering a public school in an area outside of Philadelphia. And when I open up the course catalog, I noticed that they have separated their courses into three different areas. One focused on basic level English course, basic level math, honors math, honors English, and what they call accelerated math and accelerated English course. But when you read the descriptions of the English courses, there's no distinct difference, with the exception of one word. If I can recall, it says, the classes teaches students to analyze, explain, and evaluate elements of literature and writing at a challenging pace. Same wording, but at a continuous pace, 
same exact wording at an accelerated pace. So they decided that they want to put my child in the middle group or the honors class, but not have access to the accelerated course. Of course, I advocated for my daughter, and of course, she's thriving in eighth grade right now in an accelerated class. But what troubles me more so is the layout of the course trajectory that they had from middle school to high school. And a child who enters in the lower level English class will not have the opportunity to take an advanced level course in high school. And you see that practice constantly in the schools. So if you ask me, what's my passion? It's those experiences that I have to encounter on a daily basis that drives the work that I do. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, David. I, you know, I think that because we both identify as black men, um, that we might have some shared experiences uh, in this in this area. Um, and I also want to thank you, Nancy, for the strong words that you gave in in starting off this conversation. I think it was really powerful, and I'm I'm even more proud to be a part of this uh, as a result of of things that you said. Um, you know, when I think about the answer to this question, um, you know, we think about experiences as things that happened in the past or memory from a, a year or, or from our childhood or things like that, that, you know, would drive the the continuation of the work that we do. For me, it's it's an everyday thing. It's a my current situation. Um, and I and I have because of my chosen career path and, and doing work in diversity, and inclusion and civil rights enforcement. I live kind of this experience and then I work this experience and all that that comes with it. Um, but I'll say that the reason why I feel trouble with explaining, you know, what, what any individual personal experience um, that I can think of is because I'm existing in this at all times. I'm currently living in a house that I bought in a black neighborhood because living here makes me feel safer. And my neighborhood doesn't have as many grocery stores or infrastructure or things like that because this is a historically black area where I live. And systemically and historically, places where people who look like me were given the option of living um, did not receive, were not awarded, did not get the same types of things, benefits, um, or experiences, services that other areas got. And those decisions were based directly on race. Um, and so when we talk about structural inequality, structural racism, systemic racism, privilege, systemic privilege, and all of those things, we have to understand that they are not far gone um, situations that people are currently living in the impact of inequity and equality. And regardless of the fact that I've gone to St. John's University, I've gone to law school, and I've, I've had a, you know, a, a, a modicum of success in my career, I still exist in this world and in this country as a black man, and much of my life is dictated by the experience that I have in this skin every day. So I'll say that you know what drives my passion around the work that I am doing is because I know I'm not alone. And I know that there's lots of people like my colleagues who are on this panel who will speak today who are continuing that in a variety of ways. Um, and that piece by piece, we're making a change. And, and whether it's one person at a time, for me, one case at a time, one interview at a time, one investigation at a time, um, we are changing the world. And so that's what gives me kind of strength to, to, to keep moving forward. Thank you, Nancy, David, and Rasan. Um, I always love uh, seeing Rasan again and when to school together. But um, just really, I think for me, it's the inspiration about, you know, collectively as folks of color, or really any marginalized groups, the idea about we just keep going. We just keep going. There's been no time to stop. Um, 
there's been no time to sit and go to therapy or be depressed or any of that because we just don't have time to do that. And for me as a first generation immigrant, moving here, um, you know, experiencing colorism in India because that's also how sort of the anti-blackness and, and structural racism manifest globally, really being able to understand in my own experience I am a social chameleon, and I just talked to a former student about this who also, um, she and her husband kind of participate in the same sort of metaphor of knowing when we just have to adapt our identities based on where we are. And at the end of the day, I liken it, I come from the theater, musical sort of background, and I view it as sort of, you know, the change in set. And every time the set changes, I have to put on new costumes. I have to put on new hats. I have to put on new everything. And I have to change sort of and adapt to that set. Um, the difference is that for a lot of my theater colleagues, when it's time to go home, they get to go home and they're in the skin of they, who they are. And there's some sort of semblance of identity there. And after years and years and years of being the social chameleon and sort of putting on whatever through being a generic brown woman navigating any sort of situation, um, sometimes it's sort of not knowing who's underneath. And for me, what's most troubling is once you know what's underneath, it's needing to somehow hide it because of repercussions that it somehow will change the credibility, et cetera. And the experiences sort of that I've gathered um, in really having a little bit of a common thread of being treated, quote, unquote, less than human, right, based on ignorance, um, being given comments and hurtful things, and, and all of those things you can roll off your back and you can do all that stuff, but it doesn't make it any less hurtful every time you hear it. And I think for me, there is a lot of hope. I have seen death as a result of inequity too many times. I have seen worsening of conditions when it comes to health inequities. I've seen um, just what experiencing microaggressions and sort of the impact of structural racism does to a human being over time, it just sort of chips away at you, right? We call it weathering, but there's sort of an erosion that happens over time and there's a chipping away at it. Um, and I think similar to Rasan, what I've learned is that I think what those that have whatever privilege we have amassed in our lived experiences that we use it to speak up and it's about the collective. I do not want to leave this world having the same fights and having the same conversations for my children as I'm having right now. There has to be something better. And for me, that's a shared accountability for all of us. Um, you know, and I will say standing up for the right thing and speaking out is not always welcomed. It is often lonely. It's been very unpopular, but I do it because I know that that's what helps me sleep at night, that one day when my daughters wake up and say, hey, did you do all that you could? I know that even going through situations where I know I could lose, um, you know, lose clients or lose, you know, business, so to speak, or afraid of being fired or whatever that I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to speak about a convenience only, right? And I think that that's what gives me hope is that in our collective, we have enough people. And I think that it's about critical connections, not just the critical mass, that this network will speak up. And I think that that's what fuels me, certainly, and understanding how this manifests in, in the world, but also where my role is. And, you know, I, I used to joke that I'm just trying to, not joke, and say, I'm just trying to be a good ancestor. And really what that's moved on for me is I want in my lifetime, not just to be a good ancestor when I'm long dead and gone, but I want in my lifetime, hopefully still standing and walking on my two legs and, and able to understand what's happening in the world around me. I want somebody to come along and make my work look cute. That's what my aim in life is. And if I'm taking up space in the universe, I, I need it to be productive and I need it to be impactful, however that means. So. That's what fuels me. Oh, so, yeah, I think um, sort of adding my experience, I think um, like for many of us, it's been um, a lifetime of personal experiences uh, that make the work that we do important um, and vital to who we are as professionals, uh, educators, academics. Uh, I grew up on Long Island in uh, a small community called Newcastle. 
Uh, it's just a, about a 20 minute drive from the Queens campus. And um, Newcastle is a pretty segregated uh, community. It's one of many that you'll maybe be surprised to find across Long Island with um, a population of about 91% black and Latinx residents, um, most of which are first generation or immigrant families from Central America and the Caribbean. And so this was sort of the, the international context that I grew up in. And um, so, you know, an experience that really sort of uh, called me back to the, this initial question was, when I was nine years old, I was home alone with my mom when we heard a, a loud banging on the front door and demands to open up. Um, I remember us running to the bathroom and hiding, not knowing uh, who they were or what their intent was. And uh, they beat the door until they kicked it open and three men burst in, guns drawn, plain clothes with badges hanging from their necks, demanding to know where Pablo Sanchez was. My name is Pablo Sanchez, but it's also my father's name. And so they, they thought they were looking for him, but after seeing a picture of my dad, um, they realized that they were in the wrong home and left. So I, I grew up with that same door in the frame all throughout middle school and part of high school, dense and all from uh, sort of a reminder of the mistake that they had made. So given all that's happened this year, I've gone back and I've done a lot of reframing um, of this and other experiences and how I interpret their impact on my professional trajectory. And I think the, the unfortunate truth that all of us who do work in this space uh, come to is that there are patterns in these types of mistakes along racial and economic lines. And I think on top of that, there's also this uh, stark lack of accountability for the impacts these mistakes have. So as I grew older, I, I became more familiar with the norms that generalize people of color and, and really devalue us as individuals. Uh, these norms manufacture stressful and traumatic personal experiences in the best circumstances. And I think in the worst, uh, they can lead to tragedy and death as we've seen time again. And so uh, I think it's easy to label these types of mistakes as, uh, as mistakes if viewed in isolation. So I'm really um, drawn to work of systemic thinking and change uh, in support of impacted and especially international communities uh, being from one myself. Thank you all for sharing those stories. You know, there is such, um, I would say, power to storytelling and helping us understand you know, some things that many of us just have never experienced. And so what I want to do is I want to shift from um, personal ways you've been impacted and really to ask you more about the professional um, environments that, that you work in. And, and for this question, Rasan, we're going to start with you and then we'll move to the beauty and then pa Pablo and David. But the question is this, what is the impact of structural racism within the communities that you work in. And sure. you have a different perspective, and I, I think it's going to be very informative to hear from sure. you. Sure. So I'll, I'll um, start, you know, attorney, and then also working in as an attorney in corporate America. Um, I think I have a kind of a dual, a dual uh, view. Um, I'll say, you know, kind of my legal career started because I went to law school um, at a historically black um, law school in Houston, Texas, uh, Thurgood Marshall School of Law, which was created as a result of a civil rights action. Um, the law school was made in Houston uh, because a black gentleman wanted to go to the University of Texas at Austin. The Supreme Court of Texas said, mm, no, we'll just give you your own law school instead. Um, and so going to a law school that was created because of discrimination gave me, I think, even more keen um, insight into the way that the law interacts with racism and, and justice and, or lack thereof, um, but also uniquely prepared me for the work that I do in civil rights enforcement as, as a career. Um, and then, you know, having the, the experience of going to a, a, a historically black law school 
Um, I interacted with lots of people who were pursuing law degrees and they looked like me. And so I was in a bubble of black and brown folks in law school and, and, and having professors that looked like me. And so my legal community and my legal world was very much reflective of myself. And then I graduated a job working for a judge. And then I realized that the work um, and the legal field is so heavily um, white. It is it is a profession that is is saturated with white people. And even though I went to a black school, um, I was very often the the what we call the lonely only and the only black person. I can remember when I worked after I graduated from law school. I clerked. I, um, I, I did a clerkship for a judge um, for a year after law school. And I remember walking in. I staffed the judge. Um, an attorney didn't know who I was and I walked in, you know, I had access to the judge's chambers and uh, one of the sheriffs asked me where my attorney was when I walked into the courtroom and I said, I'm the attorney, first of all, um, and I work here. And so, you know, those types of microaggressions, aggressions, slights, insults are things that, you know, happen to people and people like me in a variety of ways. And I'm sure that that story is not foreign to anybody else who is a black attorney practicing um, currently or any time in the past. It's an ongoing um, challenge. I'll say that the impact um, is also felt in the work, you know, that I have now working in corporate America at large um, and the representation of a lot of them very large and Players and companies in this nation are not reflective of the diversity of this nation. And while we have laws and things like affirmative action, which is sometimes uh, miscategorized or misunderstood or misapprehended by a lot of people, um, is that we have legal obligations to make sure that certain institutions in our country, like schools, like large employers, like federal contractors, are reflective of this very diverse nation. And that we address because the, the executive order that establishes affirmative action is designed specifically to address systemic inequality and the stain of discrimination and the Jim Crow South on our country. Um, so I see it in the communities and where I work because I am so knee deep in this work of doing, you know, this enforcement. So I see the ugliest side of a lot of the issues that we're, we're handling. But I would say the impact of structural racism for me is a lack of representation of people who look like me in a lot of the rooms that I have to go into. Um, I, I, while I was at St. John's, I was in an internship program with a group called Inroads. And so the, the mission of Inroads is to develop and place talented minority youth in corporate America and place them and prepare them for corporate and community leadership. And I was in that, you know, the entirety of my time at St. John's. Um, and I have the, the great fortune of serving on the board of directors of that organization now um, because of the representation that I have and, and then the voice and the privilege that I enjoy now because of where I work and what I do. Um, but that is their mission is to make sure that corporate America and that people who have been historically underrepresented and disenfranchised and separated and left out and forgotten and not considered um, have a chance to be at the table and to succeed when they get there. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I think similar to law, healthcare is another area. And uh, actually not talked about as much in our training when we're training all sorts of healthcare provider. Um, you know, there's, there are tons of data that constantly and continuously and consistently show sort of disproportionate impact of disease burden on black and brown folks. Um, that's not a coincidence. That's not a um, an accident when it keeps happening over and over. In in our sort of framework in public health, when especially working in population health, right, we're, we're considered um, thinking about the communities when we look at representation. Same thing, right? So, for example, specifically within gender, women are about seventy percent of the workforce um, for healthcare worldwide, but less than twenty five percent in leadership. And similar things hold true when it comes to thinking about healthcare and representation. And 
I think there are lots of different ways in which organizations and professional associations sort of say, you know, hey, we need more cultural competency training or cultural humility training. We need more implicit bias training. We need more structural racism training, but they leave out one of the most key things, which is a diverse pipeline, right? So it's, it's sometimes turning a blind eye into, well, whatever is consistent right now, we're just going to help that system and what I see is sort of putting band-aids on versus we're actually going to try to transform that system. And so in public policy and in public health, you know, we always talk about intention versus impact. And the intention may be because there are actually, um, there, there have been explicitly racist policies and laws that have impacted where health outcomes are right now in terms of disproportionate impact. But there are also race neutral laws and policies that actually have a very uh, racist consequence. And so what what is important in understanding is in the communities, um, specifically with public health, most often, you know, it's the similar thing of people who are actually making decisions about those policies and public health interventions are actually not the ones who are living in neighborhoods that are most impacted by emergencies or that are most impacted by disease burden. They're also not represented in lived experiences and certainly not getting the same kind of input. And so we see a lot of sort of tokenism, right, where you have, um, you know, a, a, a diverse group, but one group of seven people, right, who are supposed to inform all of your policies versus actually building out coalitions and building out community infrastructures so that we're creating linkages for communities to be empowered and um, be able to stand alone by themselves rather than needing help. And so we discuss a lot about um, you know, the business case of the underserved, and this is kind of uh, controversial because people don't want to hear that, but, um, you know, in public health, when we're talking about this, it's really important. Rhetoric of just like serving the underserved, serving the underserved, like if we were given five years to say we need to eliminate right, disproportionate impact, or we were to improve somebody's, you know, this zip codes, diabetes as a whole, and our job depended on it, because that five-year mark, if you don't show improvement, you're out of here, I'm sure we could come up with some solutions. But there is an understanding in, in the structural piece how there's a relentless sort of dependency to want to help the underserved, because the more we do that and the more they continue to be underserved, there's grant opportunities. There's all of these kinds of things that kind of perpetuate um, the structural piece when it comes to racism. And so I think that we have to take a pretty hard look at that. And that's how it manifests in, in the public health sector and really understanding that, you know, I, I remind my students, I remind my colleagues and that, you know, these data for infant mortality, these data for maternal mortality, these data for um, black and brown folks getting impacted by disease burden are not just numbers, there are people, there are siblings and daughters and sons and uncles and grandparents who do not get to see their child's first step, who do not get to walk their child down the aisle, who do not get to be part of their lives in that same sort of a woven fabric for the longevity that other families get to have. And so it's really important for us to understand that the, the civic engagement and the peace um, coming from healthcare and public health, that all of these policies and these um, programs really impact the communities and it's important to have their sort of input um, in, in, a, in a not just a voyeuristic approach of like just be at the table and I'll present you with stuff and you can rubber stamp it, but actually be making decisions in, in providing input that say, hey, I know you're focusing on this issue right now, but that's not really not what we're talking about. We can't even get to these buildings, right, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think that there's a real blatant sort of way in which racism plays out in healthcare and, and um, in public health very specifically. And so looking at those policies and programs for transformation is where um, our lens needs to be. Uh, so, um Racism in my space uh, is is not something new. So development and international aid, um, in fact, like many of the institutions and fields uh, that we're, uh, we have represented today, racism in many ways is at the foundation of international aid and development. Um, just look at a map of where uh, the majority of international aid is generated or comes from uh, and what countries it goes to and then overlay a map of former colonies and colonizing countries. And I think the, the parallels will be clear. Uh, there is a legacy that we operate within. Um, but at the same time, uh, institutional racism 
is mostly overlooked or obscured within the aid space. Um, and I think part of that is due to this international context and a normalized view that race and racism is a US centered problem or an issue that doesn't, uh, doesn't impact development work, which we know not to be true. Um, and when it is addressed, it's usually not to the depth that is needed. So I was, uh, I was really struck by how many aid organizations put out statements during the, the peaks of protest this year, stating in variations that combating racism was an integral part of the work that they do. But uh, I also noted that combating racism wasn't something that warranted uh, explicit addressing to the majority of them prior to this year. Um, so I think the, the impact of instru uh, stru uh, structural racism within the international development space is, is probably best illustrated uh, in my experience through power imbalances and the relationships between international NGOs which are largely based in the US or in Europe and local organizations or communities themselves uh, based in the developing world, countries across Latin America, Africa, South Asia. Uh, the relationship between INGOs and local partners is, is really characterized by the control of actual aid or the resources, uh, really the money that we're talking about. Which, uh, which allows US and European based offices uh, to shape the development agenda for these countries that uh, they're largely not from and are typically majority uh, people of color. And so the, the imbalance in power in my experience working in this space uh, really appears in two primary ways. One, a lack of diversity at the executive leadership and board level of NGOs, which I know was, was mentioned, uh, where the decisions are made, and two, uh, the way certain systems of knowledge and experience are valued as expert perspectives, while others are considered local. And local is a, a normalized term in, in our sector, but one that I, I really believe is diminishing in describing colleagues and practitioners who uh, often are from the affected countries or even the uh, affected communities. So uh, in other words, if you're from the US or were educated in the US, you have a global perspective. But if you're from El Salvador or Malawi and were educated there, you have a local perspective within our space. Uh, so the latter implying that uh, they're limited in their abilities to see the issue. Uh, this is then used to justify uh, limited participation in uh, decision making on how and when money is spent primarily. So uh, the, particularly this second point, I think, assumes that communities most affected by issues of poverty, hunger, healthcare and security, predominantly communities of color globally, are incapable of lifting themselves out of marginalized positions. And it really perpetuates uh, a paternalism that overvalues white systems of authority, Western expertise of outsiders, and devalues experiences of those closest to the communities that, uh, that have an implicit understanding of the issues as experienced by the communities themselves. Um, and this ultimately leads to is a, a global standard and definition of development that is mostly reflective of whiteness and white center views. Thank you, Pablo. I'm going to try to respond to that question by hopefully tapping into my colleague Rasan and hope he's okay with this because I think we need to bring in the legal field when we talk about education. But it's also connected to the health field and, and other fields my, my colleagues mentioned. But to frame that, I think it's important that we understand um, education is key to promoting economic growth. Education is also the primary mechanism for escalating human resources and accumulating human capital. That's why public education is one of the most important inputs for our nation's social economic outcomes. So education leads to economic stability, sustainability. 
knowing that and keeping that in the back of our minds, we also know, give or take a million, we have about 27 million children who attend a high poverty school as defined as low socioeconomic classification. We also know that Americans who do not attend college form a larger share of those who live below the poverty line. That information is very critical because in order to understand education, we must look beyond the classroom and understand the interaction between the various systems my colleagues talked about and how the various different interest groups compete with each other on ideology, finances, and power. Education is a very political um, topic and it seems to change its focus every four years. And schools, as they organize today, are shaped with a series of inherent contradictions. Those contradictions can be seen in policies, practices, ideologies, and sets of beliefs that puts us in a situation that we're in today. To give you an example of a policy to, to respond to that question, I want to refer back to the Individual Disabilities Education Act in 1975. It was enacted and mandated that children aged 3 through 21 with disabilities be provided a free and appropriate public school education. Now, reading that, you would think that's a great opportunity and should be done. And I believe during that time, there was a significant increase in the number of students who are labeled dis as having a learning disability. Here's the inherent challenge that took 30 years. I want to be mindful of that time, 30 years for Congress to say, oops, we made a mistake. During that period, the primary mechanism to determine someone's learning disability was IQ achievement discrepancy, i.e. the Weschler and the Woodcock. Here's the inherent problem with that. Those two assessments do not determine if the issue was lack of instruction or poor instruction or lack of experience or other problems that haven't been identified. The other issue is using the discrepancy model did not really appear until the child reaches second, third, or fourth grade, which means we call it the, uh, the wait to fail model. In essence, there are students who are, who are looped up into that process who are not probably getting appropriate instruction waiting to fail. In addition to the biases that that test provided to our students. The other issue is that in 2004, Congress said, okay, we have a problem. Be mindful, this started in 1975. And these are three of the four findings. The first finding is minority children were identified as having emotional disturbance and intellectually disability. They called it mental retardation at that time at rates greater than the wider counterparts. More minority children continue to be served in special education than will be expected from their percentage of minority students in the general school population. And they also found that schools where predominantly white students and teachers have placed disproportionately high numbers of minority students in special education. I want to be mindful that it took 30 years for that act to be reauthorized. We also can look at what has happened in giving our students access to advanced level courses, AP classes, gifted classes, and higher education is not better. If you look at the four-year graduation rate, in 2012, I believe, African Americans graduated at a percentage of 23.8, white students at 
and Asian students at 52.6%. If you look at the five-year graduation rate, African-American students in higher education, 37.9, white students, 62.2%, and then our Asian students, 70.5. So what does that tell you? To me, we have failed students, and we continue to fail them, and that's the problem that we found ourselves in today. So with that, I want to quickly talk about the challenges that we face in dismantling the systems that you all identified. And I say I want to quickly do that because what I want to do next is turn to solutions. And I think, you know, I, I am waiting with anticipation to get to that moment because I can tell that you all will have great suggestions as to how we can do that. So the question again is, what are the challenges to dismantling racism from the areas that you work within? And for this question, we'll start with the beauty. We'll go to Pablo, David, and then Rasan. Thank you. And I think this is going to be a little bit maybe in continuation of David's um, response because um, I think the role of the majority to overcome some of the fragility and discomfort that is going to be really important. I think that's a huge challenge. Um, and I think Nancy, you so eloquently suggested, right? Like in, in, in really understanding where you lie, right? Where all of us lie. I think it's really important to understand for all of us to use our privilege to pave the way for actual reform and transformation. I think that's a huge issue because we're so used to being in systems of oppression where we just have to put on band-aids and adapt and learn. Um, and we, we, we sort of just need to um, take a step back and understand that we can't just teach people um, for example, in education and government and public health to adapt and submit to the structures, but also empower them, right, to support their ideas and innovation. Um, an example of that would be, for example, tenure, right? How many times we hear, uh, you know, don't speak up in meetings unless you have tenure. And, you know, I kind of push back and I say, but why, right? Like, we're, we're, we're basically sending a message that folks have to fit to a hierarchy where your voice doesn't matter until you have achieved a certain amount of privilege. And um, I understand this is, this is my alma mater and my place of work. Um, it's important for us to understand how we're all contributing to that. And so a lot of times I'll hear things like, well, that's just the system you signed up for. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make it okay. Um, and I think the problem, the challenge is that it has to be a certain ownership in terms of how we, um, Sorry, my kids are messing with the lights. How we actually take ownership of our own privilege to do the right thing. And I think that's a huge challenge because um, these systems, remember that from all of the panelists have discussed, they serve the majority, right? And so being part of the majority, I'm willing to let go of some of the privilege that I have. And I think that's a huge challenge. And I think until we do that, we're not going to really get places. So in my workshops and in, in, in some of the stuff that I engage in with large audiences and, and sometimes with small boards and, you know, um, people in leadership and C-suite that I remind all of us to say, you know, historically, this has, this has advantaged you and it continues to advantage you almost like a little, you know, I've had to come up with, uh, you know, references of sailboats because most people, not me, I've never been, you know, I haven't been on a sailboat. I hope to one day, whatever, but I think the folks who generally make up a C-suite get sailboats. Um, and so I've had all these metaphors that I've had to say about, you know, headwinds and kind of these invisible forces that kind of move you along um, that you don't constantly have to fight, you know, even with, you know, I mean, the March on Selma allowed me to be here as an immigrant, right? Like I have to owe that. And that it's, it's not okay for me to pick and choose what I get to talk about. And I think the problem is for a lot of people that um, that means looking into the mirror and, and maybe facing things that they may not like. Um, and I think that that's the real challenge, but there are compassionate ways in which we can do that. Um, but the, you know, just like I teach my kids, you know, when you're vulnerable, what do you do? Do you take ownership and responsibility or do you just lash out and say, forget it? 
And so um, I would hope that uh, adults can maybe ask that question of themselves. And I think that's the challenge for, for a lot of us um, to take ownership and for the majority to, to kind of own up. And, and it's okay to be uncomfortable for five minutes, 10 minutes, two hours, because most of us have been uncomfortable for the rest of our lives and for all our lives. So I think it's okay to step into that. Yeah, I um, couldn't agree more. And I think uh, some of the challenges that I sort of outlined in my head prior to this, I think essentially touch on the same sort of themes of pushing discomfort. Um, but I think starting off, I think most fundamental challenge within my space uh, being sort of this perspective of international development is that um, international development and thinking and policy is by and large a historical. Uh, particularly when it comes to uh, colonial history. Uh, fundamentally, I think that uh, the lack of diversity across organizational leadership, and by that I mean executive teams, boards, and funders and donors um, prompt uh, this space towards comfortable narratives of development, ones that cater to feelings of white guilt, and uh, desires for people in positions of privilege to not feel like they're part of the problem. And so I think the, the consequence of that is that race is not considered a factor in development, uh, despite historical evidence uh, that our sector was built as a way to address systemic inequities established through uh, colonialism. Um, the reluctance to, to place a focus on race and racism in the aid sector, uh, I think is really driven by a, a discomfort around difficult conversations about power dynamics and about relinquishing authority, uh, which really leads to this sort of second challenge uh, I've found in my space, which is naming racist practices or norms within progressive white dominant spaces. And so I, I found it, it's often more challenges, challenging than it is uh, addressing these types of issues in clearly oppressive environments. So in other words, it, it's easier uh, to name and disagree with overtly prejudiced actions, calling someone a racist slur, denying someone uh, entry into your building because of the color of their skin. But telling someone you work with or your organization at large that being not racist is actually a passive position that facilitates racist systems requires an acknowledgement of larger systemic problems and uh, historical context that we've been um, steered away from knowing for most of our lives. And so, um, and I think the, the last challenge that, that I wanted to highlight was really sort of operational in the way that, uh, and this is not limited to the aid space, I think you can sort of extend this comment to most organizations, is the way that representation is sold to us as the end goal. Uh, our sector, you know, international development, talks about not just race, but uh, gender as an issue of numbers. How many men, how many women, how many white people, how many non-white people? So if we were to achieve some sort of uh, equal uh, representation or distribution of people across gender, sexuality, religion, uh, race, is this the end goal? Uh, have we achieved racial justice? Um, I, I would argue that we haven't and that this isn't the actual end goal. Uh, that representation actually is just the first step and just one step removed from exclusion. And so um, I think overall diversity metrics uh, uh, framed as the end goal can be uh, distracting from real efforts towards uh, shared influence, shared decision-making power, and, uh, and shared authority. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I think it's fitting to connect what we're talking about to a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is interrelated structural reality. And that sums up to me 
the challenges that we're faced with in trying to address uh, systemic racism. Education is so connected to the other systems. Um, you create a law, and sometimes we create that law and it has lasting impacts on health, employment, community, housing, criminal justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other issue is systemic racism is not easy to explain to naysayers. It's our human nature to seek answers to the problems that puzzles us. And as humans, we seek an individual. Um, but systemic racism is deeper than that. Um, there was a saying some years ago, um, say no to drugs. And I use that saying a lot because I try to educate my students that if it was that simple, that all we have to do is yell a chant, we wouldn't have this problem. No different than when people say to me, well, I'm not sure why people are poor, McDonald's is hiring. If it was that simple, but it's not that simple. And that's how I explain systemic racism. Um, it's no different than we have police officers who would say it's only a few bad apples. As if getting rid of the few bad apples that automatically it's going to be transformed. Because our educational system is deeply political, affecting change is always challenging because individual people have their own vested interests. And as I mentioned before, it's because it's so political, people don't think about those who are suffering. They're only concerned about their own beliefs, their own ideas and things that's gonna help them. So that's why it's very challenging. So I, um, I don't know that I could say anything else besides what my colleagues have already, you know, mentioned. Um, and I just want to kind of echo and amplify everything that they've already said. What I what I plan to share is that I, I see the, the one of the significant challenges um, to dismantling systemic racism is that the decision makers and the gatekeepers who are arguably beneficiaries of that systemic racism refuse to acknowledge it and refuse to allow those who would dismantle it the power and the ability to do so. And I think that, you know, not that that group may be particularly sympathetic <laughs> at this time, where people may not feel bad for those who have benefited from systemic racism, um, but you also have to understand that in this conversation that we're having about dismantling systemic racism, they're doing a self-inventory to see if they're actually a beneficiary of it. And they're doing that inventory and maybe coming up with some results that they may not like and understanding, you know, well, now that I actually have a little bit more information, understanding how many people have been left out or not concluded or not considered, maybe all the things that I have been able to do and experience and benefit from in my life are not things that I would have actually gotten if those folks had gotten a fair share. And that is a very tough internal conversation to have. Um, to, to really be contemplating that you don't deserve the position or the benefits or the privilege that you have enjoyed for your entire life. And so I think that until we get to a place where people are accepting of what history tells us and what we've documented and recorded um, and the impact of decisions that were made earlier in this country and in this world, um, that is a significant challenge, is that the people who have the power have the ability to say that this thing does not exist. Thanks, Rasan. So we we are, um, you know, approaching our last 25 minutes of this session. And the questions so far um, have yielded, uh, I think, lots of information, but I want to turn to real strategies. And so what I want to ask you is, how do we dismantle systemic racism? What strategies do you recommend in the fields in which you work? And for this question, we're going to start with Pablo. We'll go to David, then to Rasan, and then to Babuti. 
Um, so I actually want to offer three things. Uh, one is uh, just a sort of a strategy recommendation. Another is actually a specific tool. And then uh, one is more like a broad concept. Um, the first, uh, really an operational step to consider, sort of a question to ask for your place of work. Are there inclusive hiring practices? Uh, inclusive practices, sort of broadly meaning uh, policies or guidelines that remove uh, disadvantages, minority groups, experience in applying, getting hired, retaining positions, or progressing within organizations. And uh, it's not the most groundbreaking recommendation or, or strategy, but uh, hiring or who is in your organization is foundational for disrupting the status quo. And, and this is what we're talking about when we say uh, systemic issues, policies and normalized practices. Uh, so for example, in my space, predominantly white global institutions really determine how development is structured and how aid is deployed from global financiers and donors to the international NGOs that facilitate their spending. Uh, there's a need to look at representation and hiring practices because of that lack of diversity. Uh, the question, uh, this question that I'm gonna ask is, is really relevant to the aid space, but can be asked across, uh, I think all fields represented today, and I think has already been asked, uh, why is it that most people that are in positions of power are white people? Uh, even in a space as progressive as international development or humanitarian aid, 87% um, of NGO uh, executive directors in the US identify as white, with only 6% uh, identifying as black and 4% identifying as Hispanic. And so I, I really, uh, put the emphasis on positions of power, meaning that uh, these are the positions that have the authority to make the decisions. So this isn't to say uh, we need more tokenized entry-level hires or checklisting behavior, uh, but really uh, consideration for diversity across decision makers. And so what does this mean in practical terms? Uh, this means, uh, starting a diversity review at the highest levels of leadership within an organization. That means the executive team and board members, but it also means uh, removing obstacles at lower level entry points as well. So nonprofits, in my experience, tend to capitalize on the, the goodwill of young people looking to contribute their time and talent for their causes. But uh, I, I do believe that there is too much of a conflation between volunteers and interns. Um, uh, I, I personally challenge nonprofits, international NGOs in particular, to revisit uh, the predominant policy of not compensating interns uh, for the way it excludes uh, young people who can't afford uh, to work for free or the, uh, the costs associated with, uh, with the position. Um, uh, this is a, a pretty like relatively low risk policy, but it, it's supportive of a cycle of disadvantage that I think disproportionately impacts people of color and lower economic class. And, um, you know, yes, uh, I, I've worked in nonprofits since I graduated uh, St. John's years ago. And uh, I know that we predominantly work in resource constrained environments. But at the same time, we need to be consistent with our values and apply the same energy and innovation to internal issues of exclusion uh, as we do to other large scale issues. Um, the, the second recommendation, uh, looking specifically at the, the question of equity and inclusion, not just representation, is actually a, a specific tool that my organization applies as a way of assessing power imbalances between partners. For example, uh, for us, we typically use it when we're negotiating different terms between us as a global NGO and uh, our community partners. And so it's called the, uh, the power analysis tool, which I'll, I'll add the link in the chat. Um, it's a tool for analyzing power in partnerships developed specifically for the development space, but I, I think it can be applied across contexts. And so the core of the tool uh, gives a framework for considering the extent to which stakeholders that uh, 
that are involved in any type of negotiation have influence on the decision making outcomes. So I, I won't go into too much detail on the tool itself in the interest of time, but I, I do encourage you to reference it as a way to assess shared decision making power in any context, um, including assessing your own decision making power. And I think that the last recommendation that I have is broader and more a little bit more conceptual, but uh, it's specifically important to the type of work that I do um, working with communities. And so uh, it's really prioritizing the voices of community partners and their expertise uh, in the work that we do. Uh, and that is placing communities at the forefront of the development agenda. So, so what this looks like in my space, in the international aid space, is one, uh, a redistribution of resources, i.e. money, infrastructure, services at the community level as advised by the community itself with the intention of removing barriers to their influence over development decisions. Um, these barriers in the communities that we work with typically range from the time it takes to collect water uh, on a daily basis to literacy levels, to knowledge of the political process for representation. Um, you know, once these barriers have been addressed, uh, I think the next step is really actively elevating these voices and then following their lead in redefining uh, development and aid as a sector and specifically the work that we do day to day. And so that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. Um, I, I truly believe that because systemic racism is so ingrained in our society, unfortunately, Nancy, there is no simple, easy fix. But I think the place to start is look at areas within our society in which there is racial inequality uh, and ask why. And be very mindful not to blame the disadvantaged people. But I also offer a way of thinking about it from an organizational standpoint or from a theoretical standpoint by looking at systems. And I, I offer anyone who's interested to read up on um, single loop and double loop learning and how that framework could be used as you think about organizational change. Um, it, it's based from a uh, psychologist, Chris Argyris. When you talk about single loop learning, what he references what we tend to do, as I mentioned earlier, as humans, we look at results and immediately go to action. And usually that action is trying to change a behavior or remove an individual or remove a system. But what happens is the root cause of the problem has not been identified because often root causes are very difficult. That means you have to roll up your sleeve. You really, you really have to work at it. And as human nature, we tend to take the easy route out or the simple solution. And this is not a simple solution. They also frame this idea of double learning, which gets at understanding beforehand the impact of policies and how that's going to impact all students, especially students who are in marginalized populations. It requires us to, to manage our own assumptions, our beliefs and ideas, but it also requires that we have the correct people around the table to challenge our ideas, beliefs, and attitudes. But I'll offer another way of thinking about this, and some people frame it as triple loop learning. Probably the easiest way to think about it is transformational learning. Because if we only look at our assumptions, but we have to understand the context. We have to be forward thinking to understand what will happen if we address these problems and the ripple effect. Doing that requires a significant amount of time and energy. But doing that kind of work can move us in the direction to address 
the issues that was posed to us in this question. Thank you, Nancy. Wow. Um, so um, I'm the lawyer, so I have to talk about rules, process, and laws. Um, so, you know, my advice is that, you know, if you are, one of the strategies to dismantling any system is to complain and let people know that there's a problem here. Um, so if wherever you are, if we're talking about folks who are in are employed, um, ensure that your employer has a policy that says we do not discriminate or allow harassment, that they have an identifiable way for you to report those things if they do occur, um, and that you'd be free from retaliation for reporting that. Um, ring the alarm, ring the bell, say something about the things that you that are happening to you and if you feel comfortable, say stuff, say something about things that are happening to other people that you see as you see it happening to them. There are there are any in any population um, where you have underrepresented or disadvantaged or historically underrepresented groups, you are going to see folks who are disadvantaged and discriminated against in multiple areas of their life. And what we see is that some folks just have to go through the process and they kind of accept a certain amount of p bad things happening to them. And so they may deal with a, a job where they're not treated fairly because they need the money so bad because they got a landlord at home that's ready to kick them out. Right. And so they're dealing with that type of that type of oppression where one thing is going to cause a domino to fall and it's going to cause you other problems. So you'll deal with somebody calling you a slur at work because you don't want to lose your house or you don't want to get kicked out of the neighborhood that you live because that's where the schools are good for your kid, right? And so that's one of the things that I think that folks that folks can do. Um, if you're like me and you have the opportunity to be at the decision-making table when other people are making big, big decisions, especially hiring decisions like my colleague Pablo said earlier, um, you know, but on the flip side, if you're hiring people, go out of your way to make sure you're hiring people who are unlike you and encourage people to do the same. We have a habit and most people are guilty of it. Um, most people interact with folks who are like them. That is why, by the way, all instances of black on black crime are going to be high because most black folks interact with black folks. You would see the same thing with white on white crime and Asian on Asian crime and brown on brown crime because most folks interact with people like them because of racism and discrimination in this country. We're segregated, we're separated, and we, we deal with people who are most like us. Um, and so do go out of your way to build those teams. And if you're a true ally of this work, and if you're in a position of power and of privilege, do the things that you need to do to make sure that your team is unlike you, the people that work for you are unlike you and give them an opportunity to have a seat at the table as well. Um, that's what I got. And I will say, I think maybe my answer will kind of take everything and amalgamate a little, a little bit. Um, facts are facts. Science is not a belief system. I don't know when it became one, but apparently it is. Um, two plus two equals four, whether you believe it or not, that it just is what it is. And we're dealing with um, a convergence of, you know, machine learning and algorithms and social um, media sort of being out there in a way that is unprecedented. We're dealing with misinformation. We're dealing with, again, science being a belief system. Um, and so I think that first, it is really important to acknowledge a shared understanding of understanding that facts are facts. COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted folks. Um, most essential workers are black and brown folks and who are, you know, uh, immigrants, et cetera. And so I think those things don't happen by accident again. So for me, um, it would be a commitment. So in our work in racial equity, we talk about um, racial equity usually is like the icing on the cake, you know, like people like, let me get my strategic plan through or do our job, do the operation, and then we'll talk about equity. And what we say is, you know, you have to bake it into the cake. Um, and that really requires sort of examining what it means to have events come up that kind of cause a rift in your organization that um, sort of speak to the organizational culture or norms that, you know, there's a reason why things happen, right? Things don't just happen because things blow up in like a second. It usually takes, you know, other things to happen to set it up, so to speak. 
So, baking it into the cake and having a commitment to it means revisiting the policies. So, Rasan just, just mentioned about having policies about, um, you know, complaining. Um, you need to revisit policies to make sure that they're actually protective for the individual and not punitive in nature. Um, healthcare and education, I think structurally, if we made healthcare for all, I think that would really help out because this is one of the it's the only developed country where we still are based with employment. And what that does is all of these historical legacies that have been racist um, that have led to implicit and explicit biases that have led to sort of these policies and procedures that have sort of paved their way for hoarding of resources of the majority. Um, people are in those situations where they won't speak up because they need the job to get health care, right? You've got COVID-19 essential workers and healthcare professionals who died taking care of patients and now their families are out of health care because it was they were the main bearer of health care when it came to their families. So I think that if we structurally look at it, health care and education, having that be a provision, people could actually we probably have a more productive society because you would maximize your talent in positions based on where you can contribute best rather than where you get the best health care. Um, the other thing I will say is just two questions that we need to really commit to is intention versus impact. And what assumption are we making? A lot of things are well intended. Um, we all have, have said these sort of non apologies. So I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. That's not a real apology because the impact of how things land, you just kind of have to own up to it as, as, as uncomfortable as that, that might be. And ask yourselves, what assumptions are we making with these policies, with these programs, with having people at the table who we think are giving us the right answer? I'm not really sure. It is unethical to create documents and statements and charters unless you're actually going to own up to what your organizational norms are so that you can create an environment for a better diverse pipeline. And I agree with Pablo about the diversity metrics. You know, it's, it's check. LGBT, like it's, it's all of these checklisting behaviors that I would say say no to because um, it create it's, it's unethical because now you got people there, but your environment is not nurturing and it is not protective. It is punitive. And I think the core of all of that I'll leave with is humility. I, I say that humility is the sexiest attribute of being a human being. And I hold on to that because every conversation should evolve, right? Conversations should be messy and, and it's not to squash um, conversation. It is to have disconfirming opinion. I seek disconfirming opinion in my tribe and in my life because it's important to, to do that. And, you know, growing up in Washington Heights, um, we always sort of say, you know, que le vale la pena, right? Like it's worth it. And so having humility and having these conversations that are going to help us evolve are going to be worth it. And so I think having that at the core will allow us to show our commitment and really stick with it. Okay, greatest panel in the world. Three minutes for this next question. So this moment in time clearly feels different than any other time before in how we're having this conversation. We have an election coming up in two weeks. We're engaged in listening to ways we never have before. What is one call to action you would have for everybody on this call? And for this question, we'll start with David, move to Rasan the beauty and end up with Pablo. Let's go for it. Two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, for me, um, I'm disappointed because we have adults who should be modeling appropriate behavior and power um, who cannot, who do not have the intellectual courage to stand up for its right. So my call to action to youth to continue the work that you've been doing, um, fighting for justice, utilize TikTok, Instagram, whatever, and, and please don't laugh at me, those of you who I can't see on this call, but I am familiar with TikTok. But also, if you have age, be involved in voting for those individuals that you want to be in power who can model the values that you think is important. Um, the reason why we're in this situation is not because the education system, it's because people who enact policies within those educational systems, those legal systems, et cetera. And we need to do better to take charge of that. Thank you. So I will say um, for those of you who might be a part of a group that is historically underrepresented 
marginalized, separated, left out, um, that you vote on November 3rd, if you haven't already done so, and that you take somebody with you, um, and that you do everything you can to support the exercising of your rights as a American and to, to use the power that you have to change things. Um, there is definitely a tone at the top, and that is definitely impacting behavior and conduct that we are seeing um, in this in this world. Um, I don't know <laughs> if there's anything more immediate um, than, than doing that. Uh, for those of you who are um, you know, entering the workforce, maybe you have recently graduating and starting to graduate, uh, starting to, to look for your first job, move on in your career. Um, ask those those tough questions about what your experience is going to be like if you're going to that employer. Set some expectations on the behaviors that you're going to deal with and what you're not going to deal with. I can tell you as a person who's working kind of in this human capital field that the the large swath of corporate corporate America is very much in tune and aware that millennials and Gen Z's are making up the majority of the workforce and that they base their employment decisions on where they want to work about the values of the companies that they're going to and basing their decisions on which job can pay them the most money. And so that is making an impact in the way corporate America is running their operation. Um, and so I encourage you all to continue to ask those questions, ask people about how they feel about diversity and inclusion. What's your company's commitment to ask those questions on your interview and ask for proof that that company is living up to it? I completely agree. I think vote. Um, I became a citizen recently. My immigration. Um, let's just say journey and uh, you know it, it it brings me to tears when i think about this i get very emotional about it um the first election i was able to vote in was the hillary and trump election and um you know regardless of where you lie um whew, it's so important people have laid down their lives people have fought for us People have fought for the very existence of us. And um, I just think it's so important to take part in the civic process and give back and, and, and have your voice be heard. Um, vote, please vote, please vote. And, you know, just make a commitment that you're going to not take this for granted. And, um, yeah, sorry, I get really, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I get emotional, but it's. It's so important, um, and and just like the voting is a very tangible thing for us to do, please follow Rasan's advice and ask and speak up. Please question things. Um, th there's also a business case to be made, right? We don't all of a sudden have organic food and and all these things because there all of a sudden people realize it was cool. It's because it's a business case because people demand it. So please, please, as part of the workforce. Um, ask those questions, demand change and transformation, not checklists. Demand that we're all part of a collective where we can raise the level of consciousness for all of us. Um, leave, leave this better than, so it, it's better for all of us and even after we're all long gone. I'll be extremely brief my call to action. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was uh, to to my non-Black people of color, um, I think we need to acknowledge the ways that we are also complicit in um, in supporting systems of anti-Blackness in this country. And I think it's something that in these spaces perhaps isn't addressed enough or we don't get that deep into the conversation. But uh, I, I encourage all of you to address these issues within your families, within your families. Um, so many of the rights that we enjoy were gained through battles won uh, by the black community in this country, and uh, we need to go up to bat for each other. And um, the second point is that I don't think that you can be uh, against racism or systems of oppression and stay apolitical. Um, we can't be moderate or lukewarm in our response to injustices. And uh, it's difficult because uh, our political system, it, it, it's the outside of our political system, it's not a binary decision. There are multiple paths representing varying degrees of progress. 
but uh, in the decisions that we have before us, uh, I believe there's one clear path backwards. And, um, and so go out and vote. So I'm going to turn this back over to Rebecca in a moment, but I just want to say, you know, I said in my introduction that I was honored to be moderating this panel and in closing it out, I think, you know, the sentiment that I really want to share is that I'm just grateful. You know, this is the power of St. John's right here. And we talked about, you know, decision makers and we talked about gatekeepers. We are those people. Right, and and if we all commit, we can make change. And just by spending a little time with all of you, I I am more inspired and motivated than ever. So I just want to thank you all, Rebecca. I'll turn it over to you. It was beautifully said, Nancy. Um, thank you to Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Aria, Dean Bell, uh, Mr. Cofield, and Mr. Sanchez for leading this conversation. Um, and thank you to all of the hundred attendees for joining today's session. Um, just a reminder that it is our plan that any unanswered questions will be gathered and addressed in future conversations. Um, this video will be posted a week from today um, and can be rewatched re and shared with others. Um, just visit stjohns.edu slash racial justice. The next topic is where St. John's University goes from here on Wednesday, November 18th at 1.50 p.m. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill out the short event feedback survey. The survey will appear once you uh, click to exit the session. Um, series information, future session details, and the recordings can be found at stjohns.edu slash racial justice. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great night.